Well, uh, very good morning class and for today we are dealing with the chapter titled Silk Road by Nick Middleton and this basically is about a pilgrimage that the writer undertakes which is also known as a Kora which is a Tibetan word which uh, basically uh, translates to revolution in which one takes a religious pilgrimage around a holy uh, place in the clockwise direction in this case our writer goes to Mount Kailash and this is his story through the pilgrimage all right so without much further ado let's just get into the story a flawless half moon floated in a perfect blue sky on the morning we said our goodbyes extended banks of cloud-like long French loaves glowed pink as the sun emerged to splash the distant mountain top with a rose tinted blush now that we were leaving, Ravu Lamo said she wanted to give me a farewell present. So he is starting a journey from Ravu. One evening I had told her through Daniel that I was heading towards Mount Kailash to complete the Korra, right, the religious pilgrimage. And she said that I ought to get some warmer clothes. After ducking back into her tent, she emerged carrying one of the long-sleeved sheepskin coats that all men wore. Sitin sized me up as we clambered into his car. Ah, oh, yes, he declared. Drogba, sir. We took a shortcut to get off Changtang. Chitin knew a route that would take us southwest, almost directly towards Mount Kailash. It involved crossing several fairly high mountain passes, he said. But no problem, sir, he assured us. If there is no snow, what was the likelihood of that, I asked. Not knowing, sir, until we get there. And she then said that we'll have no problem as long as it doesn't snow. And then Narita wanted to know when does it snow. And she then very uh, innocently said that even he doesn't know. He'll only know when we get there. From the gently rolling hills of Ravu, the shortcut took us across vast open plains with nothing in them except a few gazelles that would look up from nibbing the arid pasture and frown before bounding away into the wild, into the woods. Further on, where the plains became more stony than grassy, a great herd, a wild ass, came into view. Sitan told us we were approaching them long before they appeared. Young, he said pointing towards a far-off pall of dust. When we drew near, I could see the herd galloping a mass, wheeling and turning in tight formation, as if they were practicing maneuvers on some predetermined course. Plumes of dust billowed into the crisp, clean air. So he was taking in the natural sights of the mountain as he has begun his journey or rather as he begins his pilgrimage as hills start to push up once more <clears throat> from the rocky wilderness we pass solitary drogbas tending their flocks sometimes men sometimes women these well-wrapped figures would pause and stare at our car occasionally waving as we passed when the track took us close to the animals the sheep would take evasive action Veering away from the speeding vehicle, we passed no miles. Dark tents pitched in splendid isolation. Usually with a huge black dog, a Tibetan mastiff, standing guard. These beasts would cock their great big heads as they became aware of our approach and fix us in their sights. As we continued to draw closer, they would explode into action, speeding directly towards us, like a bullet from a gun and nearly as fast. These shaggy monsters, blacker than the darkest nights, usually wore bright red collars and barked furiously with massive jaws. They were completely fearless of our vehicle, shooting straight into our path, causing Chitin to break and swerve. The dog would make chase for a hundred meters or so before easing off, having seen us off the property. It wasn't difficult to understand why ferocious Tibetan Mastiff became popular in China's imperial courts as hunting dogs. 
brought along the Silk Road by ancient times. In ancient times, as tribute from Tibet. Now, the Tibetan master dogs are very fierce, right? And they are kept to protect the sheep in the mountains, and they are so fierce that it can even take on wolves and hyenas. By now, you could see snow capped mountains gathering on the horizon. We entered a valley where the river was wide and mostly clogged with ice, brilliant white and glinting in the sunshine. The trail hugged its bank, twisting with the meanders as we gradually gained height and the valley sides closed in. The turns became sharper and the ride bumpier. Chitin now in third gear as we continued to climb. The track moved away from the icy water river, laboring through steeper slopes that spotted big rock dobbled with patches of bright orange light. Beneath the rocks, hunks of snow clung on in the near permanent sheet. I felt the pressure building up in my ears, held my nose, snorted and cleared them. We struggled around another tight bend and Sitan stopped. He had opened his door and jumped out of his seat before I realized what was going on. Snow, said Daniel, as he too exited the vehicle, letting in a breath of cold air as he did so. A swath of the white fluffy, white stuff came across the track in front of us, stretching for maybe 15 meters before it pattered out and the dirt trail reappeared. The stool continued on either side of us, smoothing the abrupt bank on the upslope side. The bank was too steep for our vehicle to scale, so there was no way around the snow patch. I joined Daniel as Sitan stepped onto the encrusted snow and began to slither and slide forward. Stamping his foot from time to time to ascertain how sturdy it was, I looked at my wristwatch. We were 5,210 meters above sea level. The snow didn't look too deep to me, but the danger wasn't its depth, Daniel said. So much as its icy top layer. If you slip off, the car could turn over, he suggested. As we saw Chitin grab handfuls of dirt and fling them across the frozen surface, we both pitched in and when the snow was spread with soil, Daniel and I stayed out of the vehicle to lighten Chitin's load. He backed up and drove towards the dirty snow, eased the car onto its icy surface, and slowly drove its length without apparent difficulty. Ten minutes later, we stopped at another blockage. Not good, sir, Sitan announced as he jumped out again to survey the scene. This time he decided to try and drive round the snow. The slope was steep and studded with major rocks. <clears throat> but somehow, <this clears throat> Sitan negotiated them. His four-wheel drive vehicle lurching from one obstacle to the next. In so doing, he cut off one of the hairpin bends, regaining the trail further up where the snow had not drifted. I checked my watch again as we continued to climb in the bright sunshine. We crept past 5,400 meters and my head began to throb horribly. I took gulps from my water bottle, which is supposed to help a rapid ascent. We, fi re we finally reached the top of the pass at 5,515 meters. It was marked by a large train of rocks festooned with white silk scarves and ragged player rags. We all took a turn round the crane in a clockwise direction as is the tradition and Sitan checked the tires of his vehicle. He stopped at the petrol tank and partially unscrewed the top, which emitted a loud hiss. The lower atmospheric pressure was allowing the fuel to expand. It sounded dangerous to me. Maybe, sir, Sitan laughed, but no smoking. 
My headache soon cleared as we careered down the other side of the pass. It was two o'clock by the time we stopped for lunch. We ate hot noodles inside a long canvas tent. Part of a work camp erected beside a dry salt lake. The plateau is pockmarked with salt flats and brackish lakes, vestige of the Thetid's ocean which bordered Tibet before the great continental collision that lifted it skyward. This one was a hive of activity, men with pickaxes and shovels, trudging back and forth in their long sheepskin coats and salt-encrusted boots. All wore sunglasses against the glare of a steady stream of blue trucks <clears throat> emerged from the blindingly white lake laden with piles of salt. By late afternoon, we had reached the small town of Hall. Back from the main east-west highway that followed the old trade route from Lhasa to Kashmir, Daniel, who was returning to Lhasa, found a, tr found a ride in a truck. So Sitan and I bade him farewell outside a tire repair shop. We had suffered two punctures in quick succession on the drive down the salt lake, and Sitan was eager to have them fixed since they left him with no spares. Beside the second tire he had changed had been replaced by one that was as smooth as my bald head. Haw was a grim, miserable place. There was no vegetation whatsoever, just dust and rocks, <clears throat> liberally scattered with years of accumulated refuse, which was unfortunate given that the town sat on the shore of Lake Mansarovar, Tibet's most venerated stretch of water. Ancient Hindu and Buddhist cosmology pinpoints Mansarovar as a source of four great Indian rivers, the Indus, Gangas, Satlej and Brahmaputra. Actually only the Satlej flows from the lake, but the headwaters of the others all rise nearby on the flanks of Mount Kailash. We were within striking distance of the great mountain and I was eager to forge ahead. And so, till now, our writer, along with Sitan and a friend Daniel, was taking the trip. But very soon, once they reached a place called Ho, Daniel took his leave, got a lift in a truck, and came back to Lhasa, and now our narrator and Sitan are the ones moving forward to Mount Kailash through the silk route called the Mansarovar route. Now at present, all right, Aile Junchehishar, we have a dedicated tour to Mansarovar Lake. And the tourism department in an organized version of pilgrimage to Mansarovar. But this story is set in a time when there was no such thing as organized tools, or rather, well organized tools. He is taking a car with a local guide and is going through all the hardships. So, this basically is what a trip to Mansarovali would have been when undertaken in the past. And this is his story. And so we continue. But I had to wait. Sitan told me to go and drink some tea in Hor's only cafe, which, like all the other buildings in town, was constructed from badly painted concrete and had three broken windows. The good view of the lake through one of them helped me compensate for the drought. I was served by a Chinese youth in military uniform who spread the grease around on my table with a filthy rag before bringing me a glass and a thermos of tea. Half an hour later, Sitan relieved me from my solitary confinement and we drove up past a lot more rocks and rubbish westwards out of town towards Mount Kailash. My experience in Hoa came as a stark contrast to accounts as I read of earlier travelers. First encounters with Lake Mansoro, Ekai Kawaguchi, a Japanese monk 
who had arrived there in 1900, was so moved by the sanctity of the lake that he burst into tears. A couple of years later, the hallowed water had a similar effect on Sivan Hidden, a Swede who wasn't prone to sentimental outbursts. So he shares something about Mansoor Lake, which has an effect on anyone who witnesses the beauty of it. So whosoever the first person to visit it in the 1900, one of the earlier travelers, Hikai Kawaguchi, was a Japanese monk. And when he reached the place, it was so beautiful that he burst into tears. The same thing happened with Swede Hirden. A Swede, a s and he wasn't the one, he wasn't the type of person who was very emotional or that he was maybe a very stoic person. But even he couldn't help but shed tears when he reached the said lake. It was dark by the time we finally left again, and after 10.30, we drew up outside a guest house in Da Chen. For what turned out to be another troubled night, kicking around in the open-air rubbish dump that passed for the town of Ho, had set off my cold once more. Though if truth be told, it had never quite disappeared with the herbal tree. One of my nostrils was blocked again as I lay down to sleep. I wasn't convinced that the other would provide me sufficient oxygen. My watch told me I was at 4,760 meters. It wasn't much higher than Rabu, and there I had been gasping for oxygen several times every night. I had grown accustomed to these nocturnal disturbances by now, but they still scared me. Tired and hungry, I stared at breathing through my mouth. After a while, I switched to single nostril power, which seemed to be admitting enough oxygen. But just as I was drifting off, I woke up abruptly. Something was wrong. My chest felt strangely heavy, and I sat up a moment that cleared my nasal passages almost instantly and relieved me the feeling in my chest. Curious, I thought. So he was actually sleeping with the help of external oxygen supply as well due to the scarcity of oxygen at high altitude. And every night he would have trouble sleeping, but then he was getting slowly accustomed to it. But still, the fear was always there. I lay back down and tried again. Same result. I was on the point of disappearing into the land of Nod when something told me not to. It must have been those emergency electrical impulses again. But this was not the same as on previous occasions. This time, I wasn't gasping for breath. I was simply not allowed to go to sleep. Sitting up once more immediately made me feel better. I could breathe freely and my chest felt fine. But as soon as I lay down, my sinuses filled and my chest was odd. I tried propping myself upright against the wall. But now, I couldn't manage to relax enough to drop off. I couldn't put my finger on the reason, but I was afraid to go to sleep. A little voice inside me was saying that if I did, I might never wake up again. So I stayed awake all night. So on that particular night, he couldn't sleep at all. As he stood up, he felt fine. As soon as he tried to sleep, he felt his nose blocked and his chest heavy. So a voice within him told him that if he sleeps, then he might never wake up. So on that night, he did not sleep at all. Sitan took me to the Darchan Medical College the following morning. The medical college at Darchan was new and looked like a monastery from the outside, with a very solid door that led into a large courtyard. We found the consulting room, which was dark and cold, and occupied by a Tibetan doctor who wore none of the paraphernalia that I had been expecting. No white coat. He looked like any other Tibetan with a thick pullover and a woolly hat. When I explained my sleepless symptoms and my sudden aversion to lying down, he shot me a few questions while feeding the veins in my wrist. It's a cold, he said finally through Sitan. A cold and the effects of altitude. I'll give you something for it. 
And I asked him if he thought I could recover enough to be able to go to the Korwa. Oh yes, he said, he'll be fine. I walked out of the medical college, clutching a brown envelope stuffed with 15 screws of paper. I had a five-day course of Tibetan medicine which I started right away. I opened an after-breakfast package and I found it contained a brown powder that I had to take with hot water. It tasted just like cinnamon. The contents of the lunchtime and bedtime packages were less obviously identifiable. Both contain small spherical brown pellets. They look suspiciously like sheep dung, but of course I took them. Last night, that night, after my first full day's course, I slept very soundly, like a log, not a dead man. So early morning, Sitan took him to a Tibetan Amzi, like a doctor, or also known in Tibetan as Amzi, to a Tibetan doctor, and he concluded that it was barely cold and the uh, effects of altitude. He gave him some medicine, after taking which he felt fine, and on that night he slept very peacefully. Once he saw that I was going to, once he saw that I was going to leave, live, Sitan left me. So Sitan was checking off on him, and once he saw that he was sleeping very soundly and he wasn't going to die, Sitan left to return to Lhasa. As a Buddhist, he told me. He knew that it didn't really matter if I passed away, but he thought it would be bad for my business. Darchin didn't look so horrible after a good night's sleep. It was still dusty, partially derelict, and punctuated by heaps of rubble and refuse, but the sun shone brilliantly in a clear blue sky, and the outlooks across the plain to the south gave me a vision of the Himalayas. Commanded by a huge snow capped mountain, Gurla Mandhata, with just a wisp of cloud suspended over its summit. The town had a couple of rudimentary general stores selling Chinese cigarettes, soap, and other basic provisions, as well as the usual string of prayer flags. In front of me, one, men gathered in the afternoon for a game of pool. The battered table, looking supremely incongruous to the open in the open air, while nearby women washed their long hair in the icy water of a narrow brook that babbled down past my guest house. Darchin felt relaxed and unhurried, but for me it came with a significant drawback. There were no pilgrims. I have been told that at the height of the pilgrimage season the town was bustling with visitors. Many bought their own accommodation, enlarging the settlement round its edges as they set up their tents that spilled down onto the plain. I had time and arrival for the beginning of the season, but it was it seemed I was too early. So he was taking in the sights and sounds of Darchin. Sitan went back to Lhasa. Now he used to take the pilgrimage. He noticed that there weren't many pilgrims around. In the peak of the season, this place would be hustling and bustling his activity with people even setting up their own tents because they couldn't find places to stay. So he had timed his pilgrimage at the beginning of the season, but it seemed that he was too early, but there were not many pilgrims around. One afternoon I sat pondering my options over a glass of tea in Darchan's only cafe. After a little consideration, I concluded that they were merely limited. Clearly, I hadn't made much progress with my self-help program on positive thinking. In my defense, it hadn't been easy with all my sleeping difficulties, but however I looked at it, I could only wait. The pilgrimage trail was well trodden, but I didn't fancy doing it alone. The Kora was seasonal because part of the routes were liable to blockage by snow. I had no idea whether or not the snow had cleared. But I wasn't encouraged by the chunks of dirty ice that still clung to the banks of Darchin's brook. Since Sitan had left, I hadn't come across anyone in Darchin with enough English to answer even this most basic question. Until that is, I met Norbu. The cafe was small, dark, cavernous. With a long metal stove that ran down the middle, 
The walls and ceiling were weathered in sheets of multicolored plastic of the stripped variety. Broad blue, red and white that is made into stout, voluminous shopping bags sold all over China and in many other countries in Asia as well as Europe. As such, plastic must rate as one of China's most successful exports along with the Silk Road today. The cafe had a single window beside which I had taken a position so that I could see the pages of my notebook. I had also bought a novel to help me pass the time. Norbu saw my book when he came in and asked with a gesture if he could sit opposite me at my rickety table. You English? he inquired after he had ordered tea. I told him I was and we struck up a conversation. I didn't think he was from those parts because he was wearing a wind cheater and metal rim spectacles of a western style. He was Tibetan, he told me, but he worked in Beijing at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences in the Institute of Ethnic Literature. I assumed he was on some sort of field work. Yes and no, he said. I've come to do the Kora. My heart jumped. Norbu had been writing academic papers about the Kailash Kora and its importance in various works of Buddhist literature for many years. He told me, but he had never actually done it himself. So in all his gloom and desolation, thinking that he will not be able to take the Kora alone, thinking about the danger it possesses if he travels alone, he met another fellow traveler, a blessing in disguise, a guy named Norbu, a Tibetan, but had a good command over the English language as he was uh, working in Beijing. And he had written certain articles on the Quran and the significance of the Quran in Tibetan religion. But he had never undertaken the Quran himself, so that is why he was there. And now, finally, our writer and or the narrator, he has a friend to accompany him. When the time came for me to tell him what brought me to Darchen, his eyes lit up. It could be a team, he said excitedly. Two academics who have escaped from the library, perhaps. My positive thinking strategy was working after all. My initial relief at meeting Norbu, who was also staying in the guest house, was tempered by the realization that he was almost as ill-equipped as I was for the pilgrimage. He kept telling me how fat he was and how hard it was going to be. Very high up, he kept reminding me. So tiresome to work. He wasn't really a practicing Buddhist. It transpired, but he had enthusiasm, and he was, of course, Tibetan. Although I would originally envisage making the trek in the company of devout believers, on reflection I decided that perhaps Norbu would turn out to be the ideal companion. He suggested we hire some yaks to carry our luggage, which I interpreted as a good sign. And he had no intention of prostrating himself round the mountain. Not possible, he cried, collapsing across the table in hysterical laughter. I wasn't his style. And anyway, his tummy was too big. And so, the story ends with the Norbu and our narrator deciding to take the pilgrimage as a team. Now, as you can make out, this is a very small excerpt from a well-written work by the narrator on his trip to Mansarovar the Silk Road leading to Mount Kailash. But we are provided here with just a gist of the entirety of the story wherein our narrator tells the tale of his extraordinary trip to Mansarovar. Right now, the story in itself is basically self-explanatory. It is simply about a trip that the narrator wants to undertake and he has found an unlikely companion in the form of Norbu. And with this, we end this story and in the following classes, I'll send you the summary along with the assignments for the scene. Right? And stay home and stay safe.